next speaker, Dr. Aaron McKay of the Harry Watt University to talk about the economic um, optimization and calcite scale management of CO2 uh, UR. Dr. McKay? Hello, can you hear me please? Yes, we can. Thank you. So uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon to colleagues in, in Europe. Uh, good evening to colleagues further further west. It's good to be with you today in this in this mean, medium. My name is Eric Mackay and I hold the chair in reactive flow simulation at Heriwatt University. Um, there are two chairs and you'll hear from my colleague Sebastian Geiger after this presentation. I'm going to be talking about um, economic optimization in uh, mineral scale management uh, during CO2 UR and carbonate reservoirs. Uh, but as part of my presentation, um, I'm also going to um, uh, touch on some other topics that we're covering in the chair program at Hedia Watt University. So our main research focus is on reservoir engineering processes where either fluid fluid or fluid rock uh, uh, chemical geochemical uh, interactions uh, are of significance. And so we look at a, a variety of challenges um, we're using reactive transport modeling to uh, help us understand uh, and better manage mineral scaling in, in oil and gas wells. We look at um, the impact of chemical UR processes and the, and the geochemistry that occurs during chemical UR processes on both the efficiency of the recovery process and on the, the, the scale risk. And then uh, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, the impact of, of, of geochemical processes and again mineral scaling during CO2 EUR in uh, pre-salt carbonate reservoirs, uh, uh, deep water offshore uh, Brazil and that will be the main content of this presentation. Um, the various bits and, and, and pieces of, of findings that you will see will, are, are um, been worked with uh, colleagues that you can see here. Uh, these are postdocs and and PhD students um, at Heriot University uh, and I play tribute to them and how they've coped during the, the lockdown period and, and remained uh, very, very active. Uh, and I also want to uh, acknowledge um, my colleagues at Heriot University and some of the chairs as we, as, as we go through the presentation. And then looking forward, um, uh, last year we changed our name from the Institute of uh, Petroleum Engineering to the Institute of Geoenergy Engineering, recognizing uh, the requirement to, to engage with the energy transition. And so I want to finish off with some forward looking uh, thoughts in terms of gas storage. So first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, optimization of treatments, uh, chemical treatments that are designed to prevent uh, inorganic scale from farming in, in, in oil wells. So type of thing that you can see in the bottom left here, um, uh, scale deposits in a, in, 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 a, in a tubing and the design of treatments to prevent uh, uh, that, that kind of occurrence. So uh, we have an in-house code called Squeeze and uh, we're looking at um, uh, applying techniques to um, uh, select the optimal treatment design where we define optimal as being one that provides the lowest cost per barrel of water protected. Um, and so we've used this gradient descent uh, method um, and as a consequence of uh, this work we've identified that the most efficient treatments are always achieved when the inhibitor chemicals are applied at the highest concentration uh, uh, permitted without causing uh, 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 formation damage due to, due to incompatibilities. Uh, and that's associated with the ability to propagate uh, uh, these chemicals at uh, uh, better propagate them at higher concentrations. And the modeling has, has enabled us to identify, if you look at the, the, the graph on the bottom right, on the y-axis we have the um, cost in, in, in pounds sterling per barrel of water produced um, uh, for uh, various uh, uh, target uh, amounts of water that we might want to protect from half a million up to four million barrels of water and 
looking at different chemical volumes that might be applied in a treatment. And obviously, the lower the chemical volume, then the more frequently you have to perform these treatments. But we're able to identify that uh, a chemical volume of some, in this particular example, chemical volume of some 200 uh, barrels of, of, of chemical would be the one that would give the lowest cost, something under 25 pence per barrel of water uh, protected. And so that's a very useful tool for uh, uh, production technologists to use in the, in the design of these uh, um, scale management treatments. So let me move on to um, the next piece of work, which is uh, to do with coupling uh, a visualization, a flow cell, visual flow cell, some 3D printing and some uh, poor scale modeling that has been taking place as part of uh, uh, as part of the same overall project. So uh, on the top, you can see that the flow cell and on the right hand side of the flow cell, there is space for an insert. The insert is, is, is 3D printed. In this particular case, we've just got a, a fairly regular looking shape, a kind of brick-like brick structure with, with, with gaps in it. And the white powder, if, if, if you will, is is actually barium sulfate scale has deposited in the system uh, when we introduce a, a barium rich brine and a sulfate rich brine on the left of the system. We analyze the effluent as you can see on the bottom left and that gives us information on um, uh, so by material balance we can determine how much has been put in, how much has been taken out and, and how much uh, barium and how much sulfate is um, remaining in the system and the orange line there indicates uh, uh, the, the pressure differential across the system and uh, uh, spikes correspond to periods when there have been blockages. And you'll notice that there's a couple of spikes there around 130 and 150 minutes. Uh, those spikes uh, were temporary and the scale dislodged. But then at the end there uh, of the plot, there was a major blockage uh, and that prevented any, any further flow. And that was the end of the experiment. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see that there's a there, um, we had some uh, slats, and this is modeling of the system. Um, uh, so we had some uh, a barium rich brine on top and a sulfate rich brine on the bottom flowing through the system. And you could see there that the, the um, uh, was deposition uh, gradually taking on the, on the, on, on, on the back part of, the, of, the, of one of the middle slats there uh, over, over time. And in fact, the modeling results have matched what we've observed uh, experimentally very, very closely indeed. So this brings us on to the, the, the capabilities that we have, both in terms of 3D printing, and on the right-hand side here, you can see uh, another 3D insert. So this is a, a, um, an idealistic, an ideal pore structure, um, but we can also print more realistic rock lookalike structures. Um, and on the left-hand side, we have a CT scan after a scaling brine has been flown through this through this system. So we can identify where the scale deposition is taking place and indeed also uh, which pores remain unblocked uh, during this process. Uh, and again, we'll measure the, the effluent concentrations to, to make sure that we're, we're, we're getting a good mass balance. Um, and this enables us to understand the interaction between fluid flow rates and, and residence time on, on the one hand and uh, the speed of the, of the chemical reaction on the other hand and how that impacts where the deposition takes place and how the blockages will occur. Moving now on to chemical UR processes and um, uh, particularly looking at uh, alkali surfactant polymer flooding uh, and uh, doing um, reactive transport modeling to understand the propagation of, the, of, the, of these components and also their, um, their impact on the, on, the, on the scaling risk. So um, the alkali surfactant are, are injected to mobilize uh, residual oil, whereas the polymer is added to improve the sweep efficiency. Um, polymer uh, uh, flooding has been, has, has been modeled for, for, for decades now very successfully. Um, and still work to be done on that. Uh, but the propagation of the alkali and the surfactant components um, is, 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 is trickier. And we have to take account of interactions that there may be with uh, minerals in the, in, in the rock system um, and uh, how these chemicals are spent and also their impact on the, on the pH. So we have a simulation process where we um, look both in, on the left-hand side on, in, in, the, in the blue boxes there at the impact of, of these re uh, reactive transport calculations on the scale risk. 
but coupled with that also the impact on the um, on the efficiency of especially the surfactant and the and the and the and the alkali and from that uh, those calculations we can um, uh, uh, take outputs that are feed into an economic evaluation uh, and the point here really is that there are processes there are reactions with the with the minerals that uh, affect the risk of scale deposition in the production wells those same reactions also affect or impact the efficiency of um, uh, the ability of these chemicals uh, to mobilize uh, oil. And you can see on the right hand side here a plot of recovery factor uh, against poor volume throughput for a particular system. Um, the, the, the light blue line being a, a base case water flood only. And then you can see it uh, after two poor volumes, a high pH, a pH 11 uh, uh, slug of uh, alkali and surfactant and polymer are injected. And you can see the, the increment in, in recovery that can be achieved with um, just the alkali surfactant in the purple or in the darker blue, the alkali surfactant and the polymer. Um, and if we had a chase polymer or in the orange case, we pre-inject some polymer and then chase it with polymer, that is where we will get the highest, um, the highest sweep efficiency. But what is the impact on, on, on the scaling tendency? Well, to, to understand that, we need to look at the uh, brine that is produced and the, and, the, and the chemical reactions. And in this particular case, it's a calcite scaling problem. So it's the um, breakthrough of bicarbonate and calcium concentrations, and also very importantly, the pH of the production well. If you remember, we're injecting at pH uh, just about 11. Actually, we see early breakthrough in, 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 the, um, in the brown profile of that uh, uh, high pH uh, slug, but it's not 11, it's actually below 11, it's about 10.5, just above 10.5. Um, and that half, a, half, a, half a, a pH point actually has a very significant impact because it can determine whether a scale inhibitor uh, will be effective or not in protecting the production well. And the fact that the pH then drops to below 10 after that point is very helpful in terms of being able to perform uh, squeeze treatments. You know, this data is then fed into uh, an economic evaluation of the, of the cost of um, so we can calculate the, the, the value of the incremental oil and we can also uh, uh, calculate the cost of chemical treatments to prevent the scaling and that will give us a, a, an NPV calculation which not only takes into account uh, the extra oil that would be, would be recovered but also takes into account um, uh, what can be very significant scale management costs. <clears throat> So I want to move on to the main part of the presentation now, which is to do with um, uh, um, geochemical uh, um, uh, reactive transport simulations in the context of, of carbon storage. Uh, this is particularly to do with the, with the, with the pre-salt in, 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 in Brazil uh, and use of uh, uh, um, optimization of a, a WAG process, obviously in order to, to, to maximize recovery, but also bearing in mind two other factors. The first is, that there is a requirement by the Brazilian government for them to re-inject uh, CO2. Um, it's not to be flared and it cannot be uh, transported to, to, to shores, so it has to be re-injected. And also that there's a scale risk, uh, particularly a calcite, a calcium carbonate scaling risk, which is exacerbated in the presence of, of CO2. And so any optimization process uh, is not only should not only be looking at, at maximizing recovery, but should also be addressing the, 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 the need to, to store the CO2 and also the impact on the, on the scaling risk. So in this case, the study has, uh, has got various uh, steps to it. Uh, the first is um, generating a, a production forecast and then optimizing that for recovery. Um, in fact, taking into account recovery and uh, the need to store the CO2. Um, and then also adding on to that the skill, uh, the impact on skill management, so as we can get a, an overall all an, uh, analysis of, of strategies involved. So um, as part of the, the forecasting process, we have to have geological models, we have to have fluid properties, uh, uh, including uh, any geochemical reactions that can take place. Uh, we're going to be looking here exclusively at the carbonate system. Um, so these are these are the data uh, pertinent for for the for the aqueous and mineral reactions uh, for the carbonate system and the, 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 the initial formation and injection brine compositions. And obviously we'll be paying particular attention uh, to components such as calcium 
bicarbonate, uh, the CO2 and the pH. So the next step then is, is, is the optimization. Um, not yet looking at scale management, but um, performing a, a fairly standard um, NPV type of, of, of calculation here, uh, trying to take account of, of the various positive and negative factors in this. Um, so obviously there's, there's, there's export of, of hydrocarbons, which generates income, but also uh, a, a, a avoidance of the, of the carbon tax on the far left is another positive in the, in, in the equation uh, that is included. And then there are various uh, uh, costs associated with, with compression, uh, with water injection and with water separation and treatment on at the, at the other end of the process. And our objective is to try and uh, optimize um, the, the WAG design. It's going to be an initial water flood period and then followed by various uh, uh, um, WAG stages um, over a 20 year period. And uh, on the right hand side, you have a list of the, of the variables that will be uh, included in the, in the, in the optimization process. The um, optimizer used was, was uh, CMOST um, and the calculations we're presenting here are the second in a, in, a, in, 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 a, in a suite. So you can see in light blue, those dots are from the first suite of calculations. Um, on the y hand axis, we have um, normalized pore volume. So it's pore volume normalized to the water flood uh, scenario. And you can see on the left hand side, uh, the water flood is, at, uh, is marked at one. And on the horizontal axis, we have the total amount of CO2 stored. Uh, and this is done per well. So you can see wells identified across the, the, the top. And I should pay uh, a tribute and give thanks to, to Dennis Schozer and his, his team. So this has been done using the, the, the Unison model. And uh, uh, we appreciate the, the cooperation and the, and the helpfulness and, and, and various discussions on, uh, on the optimization aspects of the uh, of this process, which are not primarily our concern. Our, our, our main concern are to do with the, the CO2 storage and the, um, uh, uh, and, and the scale management. So you can see that we can, um, there's, there's a Pareto front there, uh, a set of designs which would enable us to, to, to maximize the amount of CO2 stored and maximize NPV. The next question is, is then to do with, with scale management and, and optimization of mitigation strategies. So here we have uh, some, some plots on the left-hand side, we've got the cumulative water production from the system. And uh, in, in, the, in, in the blue line, it's, 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 it's the water flood. Uh, and on the orange line, it's for the optimal WAG uh, design. Uh, uh, and so you can see that the WAG design is resulting in less water. Um, in the middle at the bottom, you can see a chart showing the cumulative amount of scale that would form in the production wells. And actually the water flood is the worst scenario because it has the highest throughput of, of, of water. So although we're introducing CO2 into the system, uh, indeed the, the, the reservoir fluids already had CO2 present. And then on the right-hand side, we have um, the, 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 the squeeze program at the top for the water flood case. So you can see the first squeeze treatment having to take place at water breakthrough after about six years. And then squeeze treatments being uh, repeated pretty much on an annual basis thereafter during the steady increase in, 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 in water production. With the WAG system, we can actually cut down the number of squeeze treatments. In this particular case, um, there might be uh, uh, five or perhaps uh, six if we have a preemptive squeeze treatment right at the start of the, uh, 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 <coughs> right at the start of production. Um, so that's always going to reduce the, reduce the cost. Although these squeeze treatments themselves may require uh, for more work to be done. And all this can be fed into um, uh, um, NPV calculations uh, for uh, the cost of, uh, of treating these wells, or the cost of protecting these wells against scale by, 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 by performing squeeze treatments. Uh, and we can identify which is going to be the, the, the hardest well to treat uh, uh, and so on. And that's very useful information for, for production engineers uh, uh, who will be given the task of, of ensuring that these, these wells keep flowing. Um, so I'm now going to talk about um, a, a joint collaboration that we have with uh, Arne and what you're going to see here is going to be a little surprise to you because um, we're going to be presenting some, um, um, some results from the same study. So this is a collaboration where Arne is helping to co-supervise a PhD student called Gang Wang um, and Ken Sorbin and Jillian Pickup and I are, are also supervisors. 
And uh, gang, uh, sorry, Arne mentioned that um, we're looking at various uh, mechanisms for, for recovery. So we're looking at compositional effects. So the CO2 uh, can dissolve in the um, oleic phase and the lighter end uh, hydrocarbon components in the oil phase can evaporate into the, into the, into the gaseous phase uh, uh, during, the, uh, during the WAG process. And that obviously will affect the composition path. Then the second mechanism we're looking at was the um, impact on, uh, of, of the CO2 on the, on the IFT. Uh, interestingly enough, this, the, 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 the IFT, if you look at in, in any given grid block, the IFT between oil and water drops uh, quite, quite markedly. But then as we get um, um, more evaporation of, 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 of lighter end hydrocarbon components into the flowing gas stream, we're just left with the higher end uh, hydrocarbon components and, and the IFT rises again towards the end of the, uh, to, to the end of the lifetime of the calculation for any individual grid block. And then here we're comparing the impact of these two mechanisms, which as Arnie mentioned, helped to increase recovery by, by, um, by through viscous uh, cross flow, uh, uh, helping to, to sweep out uh, bypassed oil. Um, those calculations were performed without um, uh, capillary pressure and then including capillary pressure. And so on top, we can see the recovery based on just uh, th those, those two mechanisms, the compositional effects and the IFT effects, and then on the bottom, those two plus the capillary uh, pressure effect. And on the right hand side, we, we have a, a, a chart of, of, of recovery and the red line, is, so the blue line is just the two compositional and IFT effects. And then the red line is including the capillary pressure. And we can see up until about now where we are, capillary pressure, so it's a water wet system, has been helpful. Uh, and we're also getting accelerated imbibition into these bypass zones. But it's actually from about now onwards, uh, that uh, uh, extra uh, imbibition of water into these zones is uh, preventing uh, um, uh, uh, the injected CO2 in the gas phase from entering those zones. And there is in fact a long-term net negative effect. Um, uh, uh, so after the first WAG cycle, uh, the impact of, 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 of wettability of this being a water wet system is in fact negative and we end up with a 7% decrease in the recovery factor. <coughs> Another project is looking at CO2 injection and um, uh, how the challenge that we have with um, uh, into, into, into a brain, uh, uh, into an aquifer system uh, and a numerical artifact that we uh, observe, which is that if the gas water contact lies exactly um, at the interface between uh, uh, grid blocks, uh, obviously a horizontal, a horizontal interface, then the water, uh, uh, in the conic water above the, or the irreducible water above the, um, uh, the, the contact is immobile, but with CO2 dissolved in it, it may be denser than the water underneath it. And the simulator does not cope with that, or to get the simulator to cope with that, we have to introduce some diffusive effect or, or, or capillary pressure. And then finally, um, uh, looking at um, uh, the future, uh, um, we believe strongly that uh, the hydrogen economy is going to be uh, here with us and, and, and with us to stay. And so it's important to look at, uh, uh, or initially to start perform a, a, perform a comparison between CO2 and hydrogen storage. And hydrogen has got some interesting properties relative to, 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 to CO2, some of them which will make uh, hydrogen storage easier and some of them which will make hydrogen storage more, 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 more difficult. And so, um, uh, we're just starting, starting this is a, 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 an early career fellowship that's just started in the past month. And just looking at uh, CO2 injection, or in fact, in this case, using CO2 as a, as a buffer gas for, 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 for 20 days. And we're seeing the CO2 saturation on the, so the CO2 mole fraction on the, on the left-hand side. And then from now on, we're gonna see hydrogen injection uh, behind that CO2 and see how the difference in density affects the propagation of the, of the, of the hydrogen. And then when we try and extract the hydrogen uh, uh, after 40 days, how um, the difference in, in, in the mobility of the, of, of the, between the hydrogen and the, and the, um, and the CO2 affects the, affects the recovery. So uh, looking forward to the, to the future, um, we are uh, committed to continuing our work on, 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 on scaling and chemical UR processes, but we see a big move into 
um, uh, carbon capture and storage and also hydrogen storage, um, looking at um, uh, some of the major challenges uh, ahead of us. So particularly well bore and near well bore uh, formation processes that we need to get a better understanding of both for CO2 and hydrogen injection. So looking at uh, phase behavior, uh, the impact of impurities on uh, uh, the calculation of density and, and viscosity uh, in, in the near wellbore zone and, 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 and therefore the propagation of the gases and also the, the impact of variations in flow rate and temperature leading to thermal effects. And uh, finally looking at geochemical effects such as uh, salt precipitation and other mineral interactions in the near wellbore region. So I want to finish off by, by acknowledging um, um, uh, uh, the sponsors of, of the research, the sponsors of individual students uh, that have been able to join in this, in this program. And thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Dr. McKay. Um, we are running short of time, maybe uh, time for two questions um, from Takashwar Kumar. Um, question is, how to correlate pore level scale uh, deposition and the resultant formation damage? Um, so, uh, 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 deposition at the, the pore scale will uh, result in a, a loss of um, porosity, of course. Uh, the key thing for us is uh, to do with the flow properties. Um, so um, th there are, there are co so we can do an exact calculation of, 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 of volume loss because we know the density of the, of, of the minerals that are precipitating. Um, there's, a, there's a correlation called Carmen Kazeni that's typically used for, for calculating permeability loss, which would then impact the, the productivity of a, of, a, of a production. Well, I don't have particular great faith in, in Carmen Kazeni, but it's, a, it's, it's perhaps a good, um, a good starting point. Okay, next question. During your simulation, how do you incorporate the dispersion phenomena for your reactive solids? Um, well, so actually dispersion phenomena uh, are problematic because generally we find that um, uh, numerical uh, dispersion effects uh, outweigh uh, physical uh, dispersion. And so the challenge is actually to minimize the uh, numerical dispersion so that we can see uh, uh, the, 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 true, the, the true impact of, of, of physical dispersion. Okay, the question was actually from uh, Dr. Tony Yang. Um, the next one is from David Brun, I believe he's in Germany or also related to uh, TU Delft. Uh, do you consider CO2 reaction with the rock in your CCS scenarios? Yes, absolutely. So, so, so that's, that's the interesting thing for us. It's how, how does the, uh, uh, when the CO2 dissolves in the brain, how does it interact with the, with the, with the rock, both in terms of uh, reducing rock strength uh, and also as a potential uh, storage mechanisms so mineralization of the, of the CO2. Although I personally am not a great fan of an advocate of, of laying too much emphasis on the, on the, on the mineralization of, of CO2. I think it takes very long time frames, and by the time the, the CO2 mineralizes, it's already dissolved in the water, which for most engineering pur purposes means it's trapped already. But um, yes, those, those, those are definitely included in the, in the calculations. Okay, one quick uh, last question, and I would encourage you to go to the Q&A to address the rest. Um, this one is from Dr. Uh, Iracha Ursagi from University of Southern California. How do you consider the mineral dissolution effects on the rock permeability during the modeling work? Um, so effectively in, 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 in our um, microscopic and our, our, our field scale simulations, the, um, the, 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 the total volume change due to mineral dissolution is usually so small that we're able to ignore its impact. It's only really in the near well bore zones uh, where you're where you're going to see a significant effect, and so you need to use tools with with, with high enough uh, resolution to be able to do that. Um, and our experimental work is 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 helping us to gather data that can uh, address issues around uh, residence time. Um, and also the fact of so many of these reactions are, are acid based and the fact that the, the, the reactions will in fact uh, um, <clears throat> consume, consume the acid and so buffering takes place very quickly uh, and it's only really in the very close to the well bore that you, you see any effect. Okay, thank you very much and this closes uh, Dr. McKay's talk.